heart. I want to see you. Yes, Lord. I want to see you. Open, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Amen. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. And lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy. Holy, 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 and I want to see you. Amen and amen and amen to all mankind that's ever been on earth that always wanted to see God. Well, we can see him if we just know how to look because that's what we're talking about, all right? Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. If you'd like to turn in your scriptures, turn to John 1, and then we'll go to John 14. John 1, and then to John 14. Try to continue our thought on from this past Sunday. We're on a series now of, I just titled it One God Series, and we'll have part one, part two, and whatever, you know, as we go along in a subtitle. And our subtitle this past Sunday was second title, or what you want to call it, How Real Is Your God? That was the question we were asking. How real is your God? We'll get on to one in a little bit of tonight. But remember now, this coming Saturday will be Bible study, 6 o'clock, come and be with us, and, and all and we'll just have a good time in the Lord. And also remember now, the fellowship meeting will be the third Saturday of uh, July, it'll be at Brother Longora's, and that'll be, let's see, the third Saturday will be the 15th. Yeah, Wade's going up to Brother Tim Humes on the 14th, so we'll have a lot of traveling to do, I guess. Around and back, that's okay. We'll try to continue. All right, any other announcements? I know you have. You've done seen the picture of Sister Mary's little little baby. And we thank God for it being everything being all right and taken care of because, you know, her and the baby too. And pray that the Lord would be. Okay. Father, we thank you for this day and your grace, Lord. Thank you that all things that we could be speaking about, we can rejoice in you. To think about the day and the hour that we're living and the time that you have allowed us to be able to come to an understanding that mankind has never before understood because they've always sought after some way to understand you and to make you out of what you are and what you're being, but yet you have shown yourself unto us through the opening of the word here in the last days. And we thank you and we ask you to just have your way. Remember some are away traveling tonight, Joyce and Danny and them, and then many others It's announced that they'll be gone for the weekends and things and just just, you just be with each and every one, take care of, give a safe journey and bring us all back together in you because that's our desire. We love you and we thank you and we commit it all to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to turn there to us, John 1, we used this this past Sunday. We'll go from 1 to 5 and then we'll jump to verse 18. All right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Now notice what it's, you know, I mean, this is the way I read. You're talking about Word, Word, Word. Right. Now it says Him. Right. 
See? Trying to make it more real, personal. All things were made by him, who? The word. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now we know it was all made by Jesus Christ, right? Ephesians 3 and 9, Colossians 1, John 1, Hebrews 1. All the scriptures say in Jesus Christ, not Jesus the flesh. Jesus the Christ is the creator God, all right? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There's no way the darkness can understand God. It first takes light. Light. Brother Luis speaking on it here a few weeks ago, you know. It first takes light to have an understanding. Then we can talk about it. All right, verse 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. But I like this. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him or brought him out. In other words, unveiled him, revealed him, brought him out. So now remember, see, we can read one scripture. No man has seen God. See that? Right. Then the same God see, that said that over in verse chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, have I been so, in other words, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father that it suffice or satisfies us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. Now, over here he says you, you can't see God. Now he's saying if you've seen him, you've seen God. Right? He's declaring him, right? right? He's bringing him out. He's revealing him. Okay? But you'll be able to see him through that way. All right? Now, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The, works that I, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Amen. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. What? Now watch. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. If you don't want to believe it, just look around and see what's taking place. And at least you can believe it from that, right? So you can be seated, the Lord had his blessing to the reading of the word. Now, I don't want to back up too far, but I want to us to keep the thought because the thought is still built, even though I'll subtitle it different for couple of messages, but it's still, how real is your God? You know, how real is your God? To all mankind, they've always wanted some way to see God. They went crazy, as the prophet said, trying to write about him, trying to think about him. But you mean to tell me now that there is a great eternal God, as we covered Sunday, that has to be greater than anything we can see real because he made it. That's simple terminology, right? So you, you can go and get, get metal that is so hard until, you know, there's impossible to even penetrate it with other objects or something because it's so hard, huh? but yet it had to have a creator Amen. and the creator had to be greater than the product because if not, what kind of a God do you have? Is that simple? Is that simple thinking? Amen. See, I'm simple minded. I have a ninth grade education. I can't come up with a great theological things and say them. I just say what I think. For me to think about God has always been the greatest opportunity that you could think of in life. To think that God would in this last days reveal himself unto a group of people. That we could realize he's real. We could realize that he is so real that he's a being 
and not like a myth or air floating around that we could even know his name because his name is Jesus. And that we can see him or what he looks like. Maybe not him, but what he looks like. All by way of God sending a prophet for you and I to understand the word of God. All right? You know, that right there would be enough to rejoice till midnight to think about those little things. To know that he's real. To know he's a being. To know his name. And to be able to see what he looked like. Now remember, as I always say, your prophet said. And when I said that away, because you're the one that's claiming he's a prophet. I don't have no problems with it. I'm quoting that he is. And always has stated that he is. The point is, is you claim him to be a prophet. So why would we be quoting from somebody else or somebody else's ideas? I remember an incident that happened years ago here and some of them had went to a church and they came back and one of the brothers especially was talking about, well, the brother said so-and-so about God and said, God is just floating and around a middle. I said, but that ain't right. I said, he's a being. Amen. Well, he said it to him. I said, well, why didn't he say to him? He was saying, Brother Branham was saying it. Well, it's all right for you to say what you want to. But then when you say Brother Branham said it, I want to read it. Now, I'm not like what we were talking about. And it was talking about it Sunday and, and Wade was talking about it. And we've been talking about it. You don't have to quote me everything. You just tell me something. I'll tell you where it's right or not. From my own experience. Well, who are you? Well, who are you? Then that goes back to the who are you's idea. You say, well, that's silly. It is silly. My whole point is the Bible tells us the truth. And it said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. That does not say you shall know about truth. So people come along and they bring up all kind of, a, of uh, Bibles and new ones and this and that and the other. Why? Because they're not set on the King James being right. Yeah. If they believe it's right, why would they come up with more? But see, I just have to believe that and just leave it. Well, you just don't have enough education to be able to understand these other translations. Well, there's no problem. If they all reveal the same, then I won't have no problem with seeing it and understanding it. All right. Now, but to get to the thought, how real is your God? Okay. Is it capable of or is he capable of revealing himself to where mankind can understand him? And I thought Brother Branham did. I believe it's Christ the Mr. God revealed. He's talking about the new birth and things. And he said he could be revealed to the most illiterate person. Well, see, we think, well, they can't understand that because they're illiterate. Well, all of the disciples were illiterate as far as, because I'm illiterate as far as human educational ability. Because if you don't have a high school diploma, you know, I've got one, but if you don't have one of those, then you're considered illiterate. And now high school diploma is almost illiterate, you know. If you don't have more than that, you ain't going to get a good job, you know. But think about it. 
How real is your God? Now, we use this statement Sunday talking about that the prophet said one day and made an outstanding statement on who is this Melchizedek when he said, in the beginning, but before the eternal. He said, well, you can't do that. You can't go back past that. Well, on that message, we'll get back to it probably a little later. On that message, he talks about going back into the mind of God. Well, then we talked about Sunday where that and read the scripture there of 2 Corinthians where it tells about Paul said he was taken up to the third heaven and saw things that were not lawful to speak of. Brother Brown said he went to the first heaven. Did he believe that if Paul went to the third? Well, how about it? Is there more heavens besides those or whatever? I don't know. None of my business. I'm just saying the Bible tells me there's that many. Right. right? The prophet verifies there's that many. So then we ought to be able to listen and think about the great eternal God is what I was trying to get at Sunday to you. See, our thoughts and ideas of an eternal God or a self-existing one is just like, and, and you'll quote Brother Branham and say, there was no air, there was no star, there was no this or, or none of that, you know, existing. Well, we just think that God is non-existing. And the best we can say is he's a spirit. We got up into the message they're talking about Sunday where the prophet calls himself existing and calls him Elohim. And that's the best word or the only word that mankind can use to define the self-existing one right. is to say Elohim. All right. And then in doing that, we can think about back before the world, that he was real. Well, he's just a spirit, so I guess you mean that he's just a spirit. See, then that's where somebody like me comes along and, and you don't like me because, see, if you say, well, God is just a spirit, is well, he made man, so man's just a spirit. Well, the prophet said he made man a spiritual. He said he made him a spiritual being. You don't read them, do you? You don't read where he said God was the great Jehovah dwelling alone. Nothing existed with him. But yet he was real. Amen. Well, brother, brother, nobody can understand them great supernatural things. Because even the great scholars, they cannot, that's right, they cannot. When Jesus came, he walked upon the shores of Galilee and talked to a bunch of little fishermen. They were ignorant and unlearned before he ever went to the high priest. Why? Because he knew there's the only one who'd believe him. And he knew the highest priest wasn't going to believe him. Right? How real? We think that he, he come this way, then he become real. No, he came this way to show how real he is. We'll get back to it later. When we talk about the attributes of God, I've made that statement for 40 years, that God never gained one attribute by coming into the world and doing all he's done. He had all of those attributes in him, when he was self-existing. Is that true? Well, why would we think about attributes of being any other than the fact that they could dwell with him? But yet it could be self-existing. 
Nothing didn't exist with him. But in that part there, he says there's a great supernatural being, Jehovah God. That's taken from questions and answers on Genesis. He said, Abraham, you remember that? That Abraham's seen God many times. He said, one day he saw him. As Melchizedek, right? And Wade bringing out, you know, it appeared to him twice as Melchizedek. Put that same example, and you'll follow in to what I'm thinking about. Put that same example. He met him here. He met him here. He met him here. He met him here. But then he seen him. Moses met him here. Met him here. Met him here. Then he seen him. Think about that as our prophet in the last days we talk about it. He's seen God in many forms. Appeared to him many times in many forms, in many ways, right? But one day he's seen him. Do you believe he's seen him? I mean, at least we ought to be able to get anchored down on that. Of whether or not we believe he's seen him. It sure saved me a lot of trouble if you'd say that and believe it. But if it don't, I'll just prove it to you. <laughs> we follow the prophet's message and don't worry about it. What about getting over to a place that we begin to talk about? We're talking about the self-existing one. And that, that self-existing one was the great eternal God. Real, not just a spirit. Before the world, before anything. I mean, do you think it was just, well, there was just nothing? And then some way it began to form and to do. Well, you know, that ain't much further along. Sorry than the evolution theory that somehow they wound up being a polywog and the polywog laid over on one side for so many millions of years and growed an arm. He turned over on the other side and laid so many million, growed another arm. Do you, do you think like that? <laughs> That's the way I think. What's the difference in an evolutional theory? And for you to take your theory of just nothing. Remember, whatever you want to think about, we live in life, light, and matter. There's a fourth dimension above that, which is demons, spirits, TVs, proves it and things, you know, because it just turned it on right there it is, you know. I never did understand. I all them people on that John Wayne movie that Zach used to love so much and, and all them horses and all was in that one little old wire running in the back of that TV. I couldn't comprehend that. Mm -hmm. But what about it? You see, what I believe, now listen, here's what I believe, all right. I believe of how real you can think God is now. He was that before anything ever existed. Now come on. We live in an atmosphere and it's called heaven above us, right? That's just the human terminology, right? The heavens. 
It just means simply up above. Well, then where's the second and third? What if God himself existed in the third dimension, our third heaven, what were the words or terminologies, third heaven to be scriptural, You don't believe he was real in that situation? Do you not listen or thinking about what I'm getting at? If there is a third heaven that Paul saw things, then there was something there to see. Is that simple? You know. I mean, he said he saw things that were not lawful to speak of it. He saw something. What if he went up where God was before the world or anything ever existed? You realize we're held in a frame of the world and all of the planets and the stars it's just one heaven. It's not that you go out so many stars and you get out there past the moon and there's another heaven. This is one, what do you call it? Atmosphere, heavens, place, or whatever. And it contains all of the planets, all of the moons, all of the stars is in this dimensional situation or whatever you want to call it of life, light, and matter. Right? But what about two more heavens above there? You say, well, yeah. I say, Brother Dale, you, you're trying to get us to believe that God is real, that he was back there as himself. I said, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to believe it myself. Not to say that you had to wait until he came in human flesh to be able to believe that he come become real. Like I've told you over and over and over, people don't like me because of that. But when I say son of God, not eternal sonships, but the Son of God was the Logos, the Word, Jesus Christ that created all things back there. Where did he get the material to build it? So you're not thinking about a third dimension. You're thinking about this well as over here or maybe a little bit higher up there. Have you ever thought about this whole universe is one mass and it could be called one heaven. One place. What about God dwelling in a certain place? Is your God real enough to be able to live in a dimensional situation or whatever you want to call it and be so real until they could have been a world just like this world and could still be a world just like this world out there past all of these heavens. And I am not talking about extraterrestrial beings or whatever you call it. I don't believe in them. You don't believe it's some people living out there on the planet? No. And I'll tell it like this to show you why I don't. If there is anybody on Mars and living there, they need a savior. We need to get to Mars to tell them about Jesus Christ. Not to try to go live. Uh uh. Come on, folks, you're going to figure out one of these days what I've taught you for 50 years. Right here is the center of the universe. Bible says it. Where? 
future homes coming down upon this earth. Am I right? So here's the center of the universe. No, we're just a little speck. This is where God lives because this is where he's condescended down to. What could it be? Could it be before anything ever existed in this dimensional forms that we're looking at of this universe and anything that there could be a, a place that he was living and that he was real? Or is your thought he's just, it's just nothing and then it starts with, like Brother Branham said, you say, well, you got a polywog. Where did the polywog come from? Right? Well, we evolved from this. Where did the polywog come from? You remember what he said about it too? He said, too, you better believe in that. And said, you better believe in a male and a female. He said, because they had to reproduce to make another polywog. That's just putting it in my language, okay? He said, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a real God. I, I wish I had the education, the terminologies, the things to do to express it. But what about the self-existing God who existed totally alone? You're going to strike it one of these days and you're going to find out something. Amen. You're going to find out when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy was before back when he was self-existing. Right. There might have been something going on in the third heaven, if you want to call it that, whatever term you want to use. There might have been something going on before all of this started here. We might find out one of these days this is just a natural part of it. Remember, you've got to have a negative to make a picture. Is that right? You've got to have a negative. The self-existing one who existed alone when there was nothing But by being able to, let's see, I wish I could find that. Brother Joe's got it. I'll try to get it one day. Where these people are arguing over how real as God he is, and the man done a good job. Because his point was, <laughs> there ain't no need of talking about God being real. There's no argument. There, there's no argument about God being real. You say, well, how can you prove it? I'm looking at it. Are you real? And there's no arguing about whether he was real or not because he had to create us. So out goes that idea. Yeah. But now think about it. The self-existing one dwelt alone. The prophet said, with his attributes. Well, Brother Dale, I didn't believe you believe in pre-existence. I believe in pre-existence of eternal life. I've always taught it that way. I certainly flatly believe in the pre-existence of eternal God. I just don't believe in pre-existence of mankind as we know mankind. As we know mankind, I don't believe in pre-existence. I don't believe there was something up there and us running around as little identities running around up in heaven somewhere. No. I don't believe in a God who existed alone. He was somewhere. Why can't you believe he was at a place? A real. Come on. 
See, I'm trying to anchor it to where you, your, your human mind can't argue the point. If there is a third dimension and there was something there that could not be told us, then that's greater than where we are now. Right. You agree? What if that was where God was? Yeah, well, I just, you, you just, you, you, I just cringe, Brother Dale, because, yeah, I know why you cringe. Because that old Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Protestantism, whatever isms, and Branhamisms. Now, you know what I mean by that, don't you? I mean, all of man's ideas has always had God as something the way off out you under. They don't want him down here. They don't want to think about a God that knows every move you make. Ever thought, I was looking at him today where Brother Brown said, he knows ever thought that you ever had. Right. Now let me go one more step because I don't think he'd argue with me. He knows the thought before you think it. Right. How about that? <laughs> See, that's the way my God gets greater. My God gets greater. Right. Whatever I try to limit him to a space, when I look at him, he just gets greater. Right. He just goes out of that space. Well, we need to know this simple thing. We need to know about salvation. How can you be saved if you don't know what God is? How can you be saved if you don't know God is real? How can you be saved if you don't know the name of God? Because according to my Bible, there's only one name given whereby man must be saved, and that's Jesus. Yet you think that it's confusing. The children sitting here are understanding better what... I'm saying to them and them half asleep and looking at books and drawing and everything else. Go talk to them sometime and see what they got to say about it. You might ought to listen to them. They might could tell you something. Now let's go on into this thought then. Now remember, until I bring it down and say we have moved down into time or anything like that, don't get your mind into anything there. Just stay with me. But I know we got another message at least that we're going to have to stay back in the beginning before the eternal. Right. To comprehend eternity. To comprehend that God is real. Amen. And to see him as a real person. Brother Branham, I know what he says, and it gets confusing to the mind. He talks about the new birth, and he says it's the person of Jesus Christ who comes and lives in you. Amen. Where's that? Where's that? He's in your soul by the new birth. Amen. The very person, the very being of Almighty God right. is living in you. Yeah, but who's running the world? Oh, that's nice, ain't it? I don't do that for the kids. I do it for the old heads. The old heads that think they know all of what's going on. After 50 years, you're still wondering about it. And I'm talking to the internet. So never, you're still, why, what's the matter with it? God gave us 50 years after taking the prophet off the scene. For what reason? Where we could all get old enough to die? Sister Cleta, you're ahead of us just a little bit. That's all we believe in. I thought Abraham was 100 when he got his change. So you know what? Sister Cleta is just closer to the change than we are. All right. <laughs> Come on. Listen. Do you believe that God is a person? Do you believe him to be a person? Then how real is he? And like I said, are we afraid of the presence of God? Now, come on, I'm human. I try to talk human and try to be human because that's what we are. I've heard people say, you know, said their brother Branham was giving an altar call and that, and said they didn't want to go. Said people said, I wouldn't want to go up in front of him. 
Why? You got something you're afraid would be brought out in the open. Is that right? If not, why wouldn't you want to stand in his presence? I won't call his name, but a man stood in Atlanta, Georgia one night preaching. And he was bringing out that God was just revealing everything there that he knew the people and what everything is. You know what I said in the service is over? I shook his hand. I said, enjoyed your message. I said, but don't you ever be afraid to tell me what God says I am. Sinner or saint. I said, don't you ever be afraid to tell me. I said, because I want to know. I know I make statements and people are, I said, I'd never worry about a thought that I ever had for my wife to know all of them thoughts. I don't want my wife to know every one of my thoughts. Well, you got dirty thoughts. Well, wouldn't you want her to know them? Well, I thought about her this morning. I thought she was, <laughs> yeah, see. Well, now, what is the statement I make after then? As long as she hears the last thought that I have. I may think wrong about her. You tell me I never thought wrong about my wife. You're just a liar. That's as blunt as can be. Wife or husband, don't tell me jokes. I just call you a liar. Because you're human, ain't you? If you tell me you ain't never had no thoughts, I'm going to tell you, well, good, because you ain't human. But you get the point. I don't mind my wife knowing anything that I think of. As long as she hears the last thoughts that I bring of how much I love her and what I cherish her and honor her. Why wouldn't you want God to know your thoughts? You know, the reason I want him to know my thoughts, where I can repent of them and get rid of them. Is that not right? Would you not want a clean slate between you and the Lord? Are you afraid of the personality of God? Are you afraid? Now listen, come on. Hey, I'm human. I'm a human. These brothers sat out there with Brother Branham and him telling all of their thoughts. And I'm a human. I said, I said, Lord, wipe this slate clean before he gets to me. But it wouldn't bother me a bit for him to say or anybody to say, Brother Dale, you thought so and so a while ago. I said, that's right. I said, did you hear the last thought I had? See, the last thing I tell my Lord and Savior is I love you. I love you. I want him to know that. Brother Perry Green told it one time, said Brother Brown told him, said Brother Perry, he said, if you ever feel the presence of the Lord close to you, he said, tell him I love him. He wanted God to know he loved him. Don't you? Well, why would you be afraid of a person? Or something real? I mean, you're afraid to come to church that I might call out your sin? Or somebody else might come in and call out your sin? Are you afraid of that? Why do you not want your sins under the blood? Maybe you like it. I listened to Brother Branham one day and I heard him to make this statement about that man that fell over his, you remember? His demon and I'll break it, fell over his feet. Do you remember the last of that story? Brother Branham said he didn't want to get rid of that spirit. He loved it. Study your message, you'll find it. He said he didn't want to get rid of that spirit. He said that spirit never went off of him. It just went under control. Right? Well, maybe you love that person you are and don't want to be in the presence of a living God. I ain't going to get through the night, so I ain't going to worry about it. <laughs> I try. 
and I hope you're listening to an honest person talking from an honest heart to you. And to believe in that God is real. And he's more real than all of your thoughts that you could ever have. Don't you want to think about him being like that? You sure want him on the scene when a wreck's taking place, right? You want him on the scene when you're lost in the woods. You want him on the scene when things is going wrong and you're hurting, right? But you only want him there to get rid of something. Yeah. What do you say, Lord, just don't come too far into my house. Just come inside the door. I'm quoting Brother Branham, doors indoors. See, we say come in so far, but don't you come in the rest of my home. What about it? But how real is a person? We spend a lot of time emphasizing to prove that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is correct for the water baptism. And what is our emphasis upon that? That we don't believe in three persons, blessed Trinity. Because a person is a personality, a personality is an individual, individual is a person. So if you've got a person, you're coming back to one. We don't believe in a Trinitarian concept. Because at least we can see that much that he's a person. But how real is he? Let's pick up a few quotes and read them. And go as far as we can go. We'll take up Sunday. It doesn't matter. The rapture takes place. We'll finish this in eternity. If it don't, we'll see you Sunday. Some of you. Yeah, a lot of you going to be gone. I told someone out there the other day when one of them come up and say, I'm going to be gone this way. I'm going to be gone that way. I'm going to be gone. I looked around and I said, maybe we need to just shut down and go with them. Right. Ain't no problems. Let's go to number Let's go to number three, brothers, and start from there. How real is your God? Now watch him. No, 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 we'll get to this is from the message. The dedication and building, a dedicating build of building to the Lord. 55. Well, I believe in a measure, now listen to him, that God is omnipresent. In other words, I think we about him being omnipresent. God is omnipresent, him being omniscient, makes him omnipresent. Omniscient means you know all things. Omnipresent means you're personally present in all things. You understand what I'm getting at? Omnipresent means that you're present everywhere. Is that? Omnipresent means you're present everywhere. So if God is just a floating spirit, he can be everywhere. But now what does he say? God is omnipresent, him being omniscient, which means he knows everything. Makes him omnipresent. Now, I, I define that like this. As far as I know, there's no spaceships gone to the moon right now. You know. So if there's a couple of guys up there, all that God's dealing with them, a couple of guys is up there. I don't know how many's up there or whatever it is. None of my business. I'm just making a point. He don't have to be on Mars because ain't nobody on Mars. Do you understand? When he's omniscient, it means he knows to be wherever he needs to be. Good lesson. And watch it. Being omniscient makes him omnipresent. If God is omnipresent, just like the atmosphere, then he's a myth. That's pretty strong talking, ain't it? Them old theologians sitting there, he don't understand his Bible. He said, but I know the God of the Bible. Listen. 
If God is omnipresent, just like the atmosphere, then he's a myth. See, the reason he's just everywhere floating. He's not that away. Why? Amen. But God is a person. Amen. Therefore, he has to have a certain place that he dwells. Amen. Oh. And he's omnipresent by being omniscient. Therefore, if he is everywhere, because being omniscient means he knows everything. Therefore, if he knows everything, he knows what's going on at every place. But God himself dwells in a certain place. Therefore, him being infinite, and the word infinite cannot be broken down into any word by any language. I love that. You can't define infinite. That's what he's saying. In no language can you define infinite. Watch him. The word infinite is infinities, I guess is the way you pronounce that. It's from their own. And God is infinite. Now watch him. And if I would try to make one quotation, what infinite means. Now watch him. Your prophet is going to try to define something that he said no language can define. Are you listening? One of these days we will figure out he was a prophet, right? If I would try to make one quotation, what infinite means, that would be that a hundred million years before the world was ever formed, the infinite God knew ever flea that would ever be on the earth and old every time he'd bat his eye, each of them, that doesn't even... <coughs> Start half of what it means to be infinite. Right. What is that now? Therefore, God being infinite and omniscient. Now, he believes in God being infinite, right? He tried to define infinite. There's no way to define infinite, but he believes God is infinite. Right. Amen. Therefore, God being infinite and omniscient, he knows all things. He knows everything that's going on at all places at all times. But he himself is a person. Dwelling in one place. Amen. Therefore, he could, we could call him omniscient. Now, he's a person. How real then is a person? Go ahead. To the, let's see. Yeah, we read that. Let's read this one because we read it last week. We'll go to number 3A, which is 2 Corinthians 12 and 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. See, he didn't understand what was taking place. Brother Branham, when he goes beyond the curtain of time, he says basically the same thing. He said, I don't know where it's in body or out of body or what. Because what, how can you define it? He's laying here and he's up here. Whether in body I cannot tell, or whether out of body I cannot tell. God knoweth, such in one caught up to the third heaven and saw things. Remember the rest of the scripture that he couldn't even speak of. So in the third heaven, God is real. What do you think's up there? In the third heaven. Well, I don't see it. You don't want to see it because you're afraid of it. I'm sorry. Maybe that's the Lord or maybe it's me. Either one of them is right. Why would you want to be afraid of God? I know there's a supernatural part about it. For folks, I've experienced. I don't have to worry about it. I've told you over the years what God's done and said and things like that. I don't have to worry about it. I know he's real, and I know the feeling, and I know the thing, and I know the human elements of us is fear. 
That's why he always in the Bible, when he would come to man, what did he say? Fear not. Brother Brown said after all of the thousands of times that he'd come in the presence of that being, he said, it still makes you afraid. Well, let's just don't get into that, you know, that we're not afraid. I ain't talking about not being afraid. I ain't talking about unsensible things. I'm talking about sensible. Why wouldn't you want God close to you? Who you're trying to hide your life. You've never got to the place of what I'm saying. My emphasis are talking about my wife. I don't care if she hears my life's thought. I don't care what God would bring up before me if he just remembers at the end of it. I said, Father, forgive me. That's, it. That's the thing I want him to remember. Amen. Is that you? Right. That's how real he is to me. When you get into something happening and your life is quick to be snapped away from you or whatever, you ain't got time, Brother Brown said, to pray. You ain't got time to pray it out. You ain't got time to try to figure out whether you got any sin that needs to be done. You better start speaking the word. You better start believing. But what about him? Do you believe he's a person that dwells in a place? I'm going to read you one over here in just a minute. Okay. Uh, they can pull it if you want to. Go ahead, Brother Joe, and pull number seven. This is taking the th things that are to be. Now, remember what we're saying over here? God dwells in a place. Where does he dwell? Paul talked of a third heaven. Where does he dwell? He's omni omnipresent because he's omniscient, omniscient because he's omnipresent. Therefore, by his foreknowledge. Now, he can't be just like the wind over the earth. Because he's a being. He just isn't a myth. Remember what was going to go? If it's just that, just floating around, it's a myth. You've got to find that person. It just isn't a myth. He's a being. And he dwells. Even dwells in a house. He dwells in a place called heaven. Paul said he went to the third heaven. Why does the Bible say that when Jesus resurrected, that he's the only one that reached immortality? Now, that's Bible. You can say all you want to. You say, well, them Old Testament saints, when they went up with Jesus, how far did they go? To what heaven did they go and stop? May I quote Brother Branham? When he went beyond the curtain of time, he said, I want to see Jesus. He said, you can't see him. Why? He said, he's up higher. Another heaven. That's why I've differed with the brothers about the Old Testament saints and the way they're doing. That's all right. Forget all that. To just, just, just talk about him being real. And see how real he really is. He even dwells in a place, a house. He dwells in a place called heaven. Yeah, but Brother Dale, I can't, my, I, I just, what's the future home? Is it not true in the future home that he's gone to build it for us. Is that not true? You agree with that? The future home, we don't have anything to do with building it, right? Is that right? Because he's done gone to build it. Hey, he, he went up and come right back down in here. Where's he working from right here? But forget that and come on with the rest of it. He says there's river running through. He says there's byways and his ways. He says there's houses. And said, if you get there, and said, you heard old Brother Branham down by the river in a little old log cabin. Did you hear him singing? He said, what do you say? Well, glory, he made it. 
If the future home is real, which one of the heavens is that? Yeah. You say, well, it's the third. Or you can say it's the second. Or you can say, what you going to do? That's, that's all right. I'm just trying to get a point. God doesn't just float in the air. He doesn't float around. The Bible said he walks in the fiery places. The Bible said he travels throughout the land and in depth and the height. My Bible said he was in the fiery furnace with three Hebrew children. He walks in those places. He's real. But is your God real or is he just a thought? Well, Brother Dale, I never thought it was required of anything. Okay. Drop back now, we'll pick up. Go to number four. Let's pick up and read a little bit and then we'll quit. I know I won't get through. I'm glad I don't get through. It wasn't so from the beginning. Now God is omnipotent, which means he knows all things, right? God is omnipresent, which it means he can be everywhere he wants to. By being omniscient makes him omnipresent and he knows all things. But God, God could not be just like the air is because God has a dwelling place. God is not a myth. God is a being. God, Jesus, he, God, pronoun. He's a being. Therefore, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, and he's infinite. And to be infinite, it comes through a word, infinite, which there is no limit, is eternal. Eternal is like a ring. It goes around and around and you're trying to find where it began or where it ends, there is no beginning or ending to it. He's a being. He's a being. Go ahead, number five. Adoption, 1960. But being infinite, then he knows all things. Knowing every time a gnat bats his eye, knowing every bumblebee, where he goes into the comb to get his honey, he knows every sparrow that sits in the tree. He knows every thought, every thought that's in your mind. And like I said, I believe he knows it before you ever think it. No, no, that, that, well, I said a little bit too much now. Too much of what? If he didn't know your thoughts before you think them, then who is he? We can pull things over on him every once in a while. You know why they want the Trinitarian concept? Because somewhere between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, maybe my life gets lost. Oh, we want the Father to intercede with this and this and intercede with that. And we want this over here. Then we, all at once we grab Mary and put her in the middle just in case we need a little more. And what are they doing now? Get Brother Branham and put him there. Come on. They believed he was God. They was praying to him. They were baptizing in his name. Are they reckon they are now? He knows every thought that's in your mind because he's infinite now. That is, he not only is he infinite, he's omniscient. He knows everything, but he's a being. God is a being. And out of this being begin to form, bring forth things, a being, a person. Go ahead, number six. Oh, we read that one, didn't we? Which one did we read? Yeah, no, number six. Go ahead with number six. And he's talking, and he said, and God is a being. God's not like your, like the air. If he would, this is why I love the prophet. He don't leave you no grounds to stand on. A theologian sitting out there. Oh, I got him because he didn't quote this word right. And he's off over here and his power. This is not according to that. The man says that. If he's a 
educated, sensible man, he's got enough sense to know. I said that right. If he's got any sense at all, he knows. The man knows what he's talking about. And Brother Moat said, what do you believe on one God? I said, God in three persons. He said, that's as much Trinitarian as anything else. I said, explain yourself, brother. He said, because a person is a personality. Personality is individual. Individual persons, you got three gods just like the rest. I didn't get mad. I didn't get to say nothing. I looked at him and I said, I don't believe that no more. Why? Because I had enough sense to know the man had me, our common words are saying, nailed to the wall that I couldn't move. Oh, I could have argued with him about it. Oh, God help us. God's not like you're like the air. If he would, you would never have to seek the Holy Ghost. It would be in you. Because he'd filled all space and things. God's omnipresent, sure, by being omniscient, knowing all things. But God has a dwelling place because he is a being. Exactly right. And God dwells with fellowship under the shed blood of his son and that alone. Not in your denominations. We done read the other one. Let's read it again. Number seven. Things that are to be. He's omnipresent because he's omniscient, omniscient because he's omnipresent. Therefore, by his foreknowledge, now he can't be just like the wind over the earth because he is a being. He just isn't a myth. He's a being. He dwells. He even dwells in a house. He dwells in a place called heaven. And therefore, by his omniscient being, omnipresent, being omniscient, sort of omni and being omnipresent, omniscient, knowing all things, then he's omnipresent because he knows Amen. all the things. Let me continue at least a second thought. Of how real your God is. And remember the point that I'm saying is it by way of God sending a messenger to us in the last days? Do we understand these things? We can understand that he was real. We can understand he was at a place that he dwells. We can understand it's even in heaven. We can understand that he's not like the wind. We can understand that he's not a myth or a thought of our mind. We can understand all those things. Why? Because God has delivered to us a prophet. That's right. Fifty years were. You know, Fifty years I've been screaming and hollering this to the people that would listen. Why has everybody else run out of something to preach and then they start on all this junk stuff that they get on to? I ain't run out. I'm just getting started. What about knowing that your God is real? Knowing he's a being. Knowing he dwells in a place. Knowing that he was in a place before any other place ever come into existence. Or do you think he was just floating through the air? I mean, I guess you think he just, well, I don't know what to do. I just really do. As I said the other day, even the thinkers got better sense than that. Like Wade said Sunday, thinkers sitting there, you know, wondering where his clothes is ahead of us. You know, at least he's thinking. People in this message, though, the way they say, we don't want to know, we don't want to know them deep things. We get confused. And we know them seals and them 70 weeks of Daniel and and all them things, we get all confused. Honey, don't worry about it. We was born confused. What's more confusion got to do with it? I'm trying to get rid of confusion to talk to you about a real God. And how did we talk about him? What about Illiterate people, and I mean that with all love and respect, educated people in this message, but 
human beings. That we can't think about God being real, yet we think we're real. We can't think about a heaven and a heavenly place, but yet it exists all around us. We can't think about his name. You remember when you was in the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholics, etc., and somebody asked you, what's his name? You said, Jesus. And folks, come on, I'm sorry. We know no more about God at that time than a hot and tot in Africa knows about an Egyptian knight. And if you know your story, they ain't no Egyptian knight. So you get that one. But yet, we say his name is Jesus. I tried my best to explain it. It wasn't J-E-S-U-S that was lost in the ages. They still called him Jesus. The Catholics still call him Jesus. Everybody calls him Jesus, but who do they believe he is? The second person of the Trinity. Now you got two persons. Now you got two persons, you got two gods. Which one's the greatest? Come on, I know their doctrine. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, co-equal and co-eternal. Now, how can you have a son co-equal with the father when the son has a beginning? But we say, well, we always know his name was Jesus. Why did it have to be restored down in the ages? Or do we defying the Bible, let alone the prophet, to say it didn't need to be restored? What needed to be restored? Who Jesus is not how to pronounce it. Right. But what's his name? Brother Branham says, everything is named Jesus for it's the only name that God ever had. That's the message of adoption. The only name God ever had. Yet we want to find some new name. We want to find something. Let's run out this name first. I've only asked this one simple question for 50 years. What if it's not another name that we're looking for, but a deeper revelation of the name of Jesus? That's all I've ever asked. But you've got to remember one thing. The Father is still in glory. Maybe the third heaven. We haven't learned anything about him because we're learning about the Son. Right? And what did the Son say? I didn't come to speak about myself. I come to tell you about my Father. We'll figure one of these days the scripture's right when it says no man has seen the Father. I don't believe when we get up to heaven there's going to be a little place over here for the Father, a little place here for the Son, and a little place over here for the Holy Ghost. Do you? No, I believe we're going to see Jesus Amen. and know who he is. Right. So why not run out this name first? God's name is Jesus Christ. I wish you could look at the stack laying on my desk so that, that it just makes that statement. Run in the computer. Run Jesus Christ in there and see how many times Brother Brown said Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus, the flesh man, never created all things. Jesus the Christ is the creator of all things. The flesh man never created anything. Right? What about it? And his name is Jesus there's no name under heaven whereby men must be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ. What about it? Do you believe that there was a self-existing God that existed alone? 
the idiot was a being. Do you believe that? And that being, his name is Jesus. And he stood here on earth and said, if you've seen me, Philip, he said, you've seen the Father. He said, because I and my Father are one. You know what I love about the way the Word is written? Because when he come over there to the ascension, he raised up, and Mary talked to him, and what did he say? He said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended. But what did he say? I go to my Father and your Father. I go to my God and your God. That's why we're Miss Jesus right now. And if there's a name change, whatever it'll be, we ain't going to worry about it because we'll be Miss whatever it is. Right? Right? Think about it. Now let's take this for a minute. Give me, give me a little bit tonight and we'll get on it. Do you think you could see, G- see God? No man has seen God at any time. That's the Bible. But that in all of it, it says, only begotten hath declared him. Brought him out in the open. In other words, showed what he looked like. Now, what does your God look like? Well, if he's just a floating glob out there, he's just a floating glob. If he's an elephant, he's an elephant. What does he look like? There was a day when you said that to people and they'd just about run you out of the building, right? To think about somebody to say they'd seen God and emphatically stating it. In case I don't forget this, I want this statement made right here. Brother Branham, I quoted somebody the other day a little off. Brother Branham said, when that picture of the halo that's over his head is hanging in Washington, D.C., he said, for you, to see that picture is more real than if you were standing there looking at it. He said, because the camera's eye won't catch psychology. Right? Are you getting what I'm saying? For you to pick up that picture that you've carried, well, and see Brother Brandon's picture with the halo part. For you to see that and hold that picture is more real than it would be if you were standing there that day. Because if you were standing there that day, something supernatural could take place and deceive you, but a camera don't take supernatural. Am I right? May I say one more, then I'll pull up another. For you to see that that light out in Arizona that made the picture of the head of Christ, for you to see that on a camera, made by a camera, is more real than if you'd have been standing right there when it went up. Why? Because Satan could impersonate. But when a camera takes a picture, it has to have something to strike the negative. So don't forget that thought. It'll be valuable in just a minute or two. You can see how real God really is. You say, well, we've never seen this or never seen that. I, I, have you ever seen Jesus? Brother Dale? No, not in a picture, not a son, not in a vision. No, have you? In a vision or anything, a dream or anything? Have you seen Jesus? But now what if your prophet said that Hoffman's picture was the closest to the way Jesus looked and your Jesus looked like some hideous 
you know I'm going to say you didn't see that by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit ain't going to show one person a vision of Jesus and him being an old man or all this or warped up or twisted. Brother Brown said, you ought to go to the Vatican and see what they got hanging that they say that's what Jesus looks like. You need those quotes. What about your prophet? All of you ought to know these things. Go to number 12, brothers, and let's hurry. From the message called Faith, 1953. And he's talking about Brother Bosworth and all of the things and that is burning in my heart, knowing that something God had promised on the opening of the power, yet I'm waiting now for him, which I believe will appear to me visible. I say it with reverence. I've seen him twice. 53. Of course, it was a vision. Now, remember that. Remember what he seen was a vision. He was standing in the air. One night I stood, and you remember about his daddy and the thing. He even broke on a straw and put this in his mouth and chewed it. Looked again, surely this is not a vision. Surely this is not vision. I stood there in the broom sage looking. I'd been praying all night. And I looked again, and I seen him with his foot like that and his hands folded, looking towards the east. And I walked around this way and cleared my throat. And when he looked around... And when he looked around at me, raised up his arms, I fainted and didn't come to till the next morning. I have an idea what he looks like. And I've been feeling for the last few months that I'll see him again here pretty soon, that he'll reveal again his something that's fixing to come. Now, remember what I asked you to remember a while ago? Anybody remember that? Ask you to remember something about Abraham? What was it I asked you to say about Abraham? Abraham seen God in visions. Abraham seen God in dreams. And he just, just kept seeing God. But then one day, he seen Melchizedek. Right? Moses, as Wade was bringing out, seen him here, seen him here, seen him at a burning bush. Then one day, he told him, he said, I want to see you. He's going to stand in the rock. When he walked by, he saw the back part of a man. And Brother Brown said that was Jesus. Amen. You think it was an old man appeared to, my, to Abraham? You think it was an old man that appeared to Moses? If we're going to stay on that in the vision, just remember one thing. I got him laying on my desk if you'd like to see him. You know what Brother Brown said in the theophany, you don't eat. I got three laying on my desk. Theophany, don't eat. And he went beyond the curtain of time. They told him, so we don't eat here. We got to go back to earth and take up a body to eat. He said, yeah, but wait a minute. Melchizedek. Well, oh, I'm glad you thought of that. Because remember, Melchizedek was a human being, spoke into existence and spoke right back out. That was not the theophany. That theophany was inside of there. You know what it looked like? What was outside? You got any problems with that? What did your theophany look like? Whether sinner or saint, what does your theophany look like? Look like you. It don't look like somebody else. Oh, come on, all of us got a little bit too much here. We want to think about we're getting over there, but we ain't going to have all this. That's how silly we think. Remember, theophanies don't eat. Brother Brown was still right when he said Melchizedek was Almighty God. Melchizedek was a theophany inside of a human element. That human element could not die for your sins. He was not your brother. Oh, that one. And look, 
He said, I've seen him twice. He said, he walked around, cleared his throat. He went on. Number 13, let's read fast. Thirteen. It's uh, the message, the masterpiece. Mm. We had, well, the auditorium. He's sitting there. He said, "That's right, exactly where he saw Jesus the first time in vision." Now it's built auditorium, built right over the same spot. I went right here the other day and looked, and when I looked and seen him looking toward the east, you remember hearing me tell you when I was out there preaching for, praying for my father. A little boy, just a little boy, uh, just a boy preacher. That's where I saw him step looking at him. He had his head turned sideways from me. I kept walking around, clearing my throat in a broom sage field, and I kept watching, and he never did, never did turn. Then I called his name, Jesus, and he turned around and held his arms out, and that's all I remember. Is that the one? Hold it, that, that's 13. He called him Jesus. He got his attention. So evidently he saw Jesus. Right? He saw Jesus. Evidently got it. All right, go to the next. See, not hour with a shot. Roll it up. Let's read five. While I was praying and asking God to save him and not to let him die a sinner, that I loved him while I was in prayer, I raised up to look up towards the east from here, and there was a vision. And standing just above me, many of you know the vision was the Lord Jesus. He was just above, probably 10 feet above my head, standing in midair with one foot, just making a step. He had a white garment, had on a white garment, a fringe around the side of it. He had hired down to his shoulders. He looked to be a man about what the Bible said he was, about 30. But a small, thin-built fellow, very small, looked like wouldn't weigh over 130 pounds. He's doing pretty good describing him, isn't he? Who's he describing He's describing Jesus. Come on. And I looked and I thought, there was something. That might be wrong. So I rubbed my eyes and looked up again. And he was standing kind of sideways, kind of a profile of his face. And the looks of his face, which I've always seen in the visions. And watch him. Now, he didn't see an old man in one vision, a young man in another vision. It's, Always seen in visions has been like Hoffman's head of Christ. And he uses 30 there. The others he uses 33. Look. That's the reason I have that in my house on my literature. Because that's the way it looked. More like that, only he seemed to be small. Hoffman. So what does Jesus look like? Hoffman. Well, you say, now, not exactly. Okay. He said it's close. Close. And only he was a small man. Let me get this face now. There's two or three more quotes about him of Hoffman's. So will everybody agree with me where I can shorten it in a hurry? They, what Brother Branham saw standing out in the field and thing was a picture close. He saw Jesus and he was close to looking like Hoffman's head of Christ at 33. I know the difference between this and how all this makeover has been made. I put these two pictures up here for this one to represent him at about 30 years of age and this one to represent him at 33. The reason is because I'm in the middle and I cause that problem. You say, well, that don't do it. I don't care who draw that or what they've done to get it. Might surprise you. We may change it. Listen. Go ahead to the next one, which would be spiritual food and due season. Hmm. Then when that went up, now what's he talking about? Tucson, Arizona, seven angels, right? Everybody with me? 
And you go back up and read it. The seven angels coming to him. You remember now, watch. I hope you'll catch this one and listen. He saw a vision in Jeffersonville in 62. And saw the angels and saw the thing and saw all of the things. He goes to Tucson. Did he see a vision? You don't remember me walking down through there, do you? He didn't see a vision in Tucson. They took a picture of what he saw. Might realize things are right. Abraham seen him, seen him, seen him. Then he appeared to him. That's all I'm trying to do. That doesn't make anything out of Brother Brown. That makes it to be where it's supposed to be. Look. Probably down in Mexico over in Tucson, they were taking a picture of it. It was a mysterious sight. So it's a picture of something that was real. Something struck the lens of the camera, right? I don't care what they say now that it was a jet. It, was a, it sure looks good. It was a mysterious sight. Brother Fred Solomon there sitting right back there. And I and Brother Gene Norman standing right there present when it went up. They took the picture. Still, they don't know what about it. Here some time ago, he was saying, look at here. This looks like this. And them angels' wings, how they unfolded in there. Now, let's do something. If I take a minute or two and you got to go, go ahead. Too far to go yet. Would you pull up Hoffman's picture, Brother Joe, of 33? It'll take us a minute because we didn't know how this was going to go. You want to know what Jesus looks like? He said the closest it was was Hoffman at 33. Okay. Now this Hoffman really is a crop off taken from the rich young ruler because Hoffman painted the rich young ruler, Jesus in the garden, Gethsemane, and then what was the other one? There's three. There's three of them where he was praying in the garden and then when he was a young child with the uh, talking to the priest and that. That's the three Hoffmans. All right. There is that one. So if you can get that one, Brother Joe, we'll just stay with that one. Get the one with Jesus where is the rich young ruler. I asked him to crop off the rich young ruler for you to get a point. You know that one and what it looks like. There's what it looks like. He said, well, that's just too much now. Well, that's what your prophet said now. So if you think he's too much, then goodbye. You ain't going no further. Brother Dale. No, because you done blinded yourself. He's the one that said that's what it looked like. The closest could be was Hoffman's. And there he stands with the rich young ruler over on this side because that's part of his garment. Hoffman's originally is that. They cropped it off and made that. They pulled it down and made this out of it. He didn't paint just this by itself. He painted that and they cropped it down from there. All right. Now, so when he went out to Tucson, he saw the seven angels. Pull that up, Brother Joe. Just the part now, not the inset. There you go. Turn it over. Don't leave it like that. Turn it the way it's supposed to be. Oh, it's supposed to be laying down. Uh, he ain't getting with it. They can't, can you can't flip it? I'll flip the screen. <laughs> Everybody know what I'm saying. You can't flip it. All right. Now, all right, rotate it. That is the original one, right? Not up this way. That is the original one. He says on spiritual food, said they told him to turn it to the right. 
He was told to turn it to the right. He didn't even see it when all of that, he was told to turn it to the right. Now you've got this one. Turn it. So you say that's left. No, you got to go the way he lines it up. I ask you a question. Oh, he got it. Okay. I ask you a simple question. Which thief was pardoned? The one on the right or the one on the left? I'll leave that one. There's what was seen in Arizona. And he says, here's the angels. There's been a lot of things been said in there. Here's an Indian with his nose, his mouth, and an Indian. Turn it right. <laughs> now put it back where you had it. Okay? And when you turn it right, I'll read it. Listen. He's talking about the pyramid. That wind that went up, the big observation from way back in California and Mexico and things. And the Lord told him in paragraph 85. One day, turning it to the right, looking, there was Jesus Christ, just as perfect as Hoffman ever drawed him. And he says, that's Hoffman. Now, I want you to put Hoffman in there. Which way are you going to turn him? He's looking that way. Which way are you going to put him? He said the, mess, the heavens declares it, the Bible declares it, the message declares it. First time I ever seen him, he looked like the head of Hoffman. I had never seen that before. And in Billy Sunday's tabernacle years ago, I saw it. My house hasn't been without one of the pictures since. Then there in the sky saying that the very God that I saw up in this vision out in here, just a little boy out here by where the schoolhouse stands, he looked like that. And in the heavens, 33 years later, declares that it's the truth. That's the way he looks. Okay. Now, as I said it, you can't put that in there. He's looking the wrong way. He's looking the wrong way. There's the eyes. There's the nose. There's the thing. Some of them are done and made differently. But you can't put him in there that way. Bring this one up, Brother Joe. There's your Hoffmans in the cloud. Do you follow me? You can't put the picture in to go that way. There's Hoffman. Picture in what he said that it was. Remember? Here he's turning that away, talking to the rich young ruler. I ask you a simple question. Musicians, get ready. Which thief on which side of Jesus did he pardon? The right or the left? Hoffman's fits the picture perfect. What about it? Is your God real enough that you can see him and know what he looks like? Is he a being? 
Is he a person? Is he real? Well, what does it matter what he looks like? All I want to do is get saved. Good. But what about the little extra benefit we get to see what he looks like? Is that any problem? Huh? Is that any problem? To think about we could actually see what he looks like? What about it? Come on, musicians. What about it? How real is your God? Now, there's no need to think about it anything. For you to turn around and go around to the world and say, this is my Jesus. This is what my Jesus looks like. That ain't going to try to convert nobody. We ain't out there trying to convert. I ain't trying to convert nobody on the internet. I preach to this church. Amen. You out there are listening and seeing, do what you want to. I'm not your pastor. The only pastor at this church. <coughs> what does your God look like? Well, my God looks like this over here. Well, then show me where it compares with the prophet of what he saw all of those years when he saw him out in the field. When he's seen him many times and he finally come to him. He said, wait a minute. Where did he come to him? Where did he come to him to be the visible? Now, for a minute, I laid down a situation before you that the prophet said for you to be able to pick up that picture that shows the halo above him. It's copyrighted. It's up in Washington, D.C., hanging there in the Religious Hall of Arts. But for you to be able to see that picture is more real than it would be if you were standing there the day it took place because the camera will not take psychology. Brother Branham stood there in Arizona and saw Jesus the way the book of Revelations describes him. The book of Revelations chapter 1 said, one standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks like unto the Son of Man. Gird about the paps with a golden girdle. That vision has to go all the way and climax and end the bride of Jesus Christ. What did Brother Ram see out there? I'll read it to you. I have him laying there where he said, look at his eyes. Look at his beard. Look at the things. He said, it's just like Hoffman. But who did he see? He saw Jesus. What do you want to see? Let's stand. What do you want to see? I want to see Jesus. Now I've had the opportunity to be able to understand Of what Jesus looks like. But what good is it to understand what a Jesus looks like to try to place it off if you don't believe he's real? Are you listening? You don't believe he's a real person, then he can't have his picture made. If he's just a myth, he can't have his picture made. If you believe his picture was made and we believe it looked like Hoffman, you've got to be at least to a start to believe in that God is real. What about it? How real is your God? Yeah, but Brother Dale, you just don't understand. I'm scared because... I'm afraid that, that God is, listen, you don't understand human terminologies. Do you realize 
that to say that God is a real person, you're putting him to a situation of bringing him not limited, but bringing him into reality. And that he's not by doing that omnipresent. Do you understand? Why would you not be more scared of a spirit that's everywhere and knows all of your thoughts and your ways and you do it? You didn't listen. If he's a spirit, he's everywhere. He knows every move, every thought, every do it. He knows it. He sees it if he's a spirit. Now, let's go into the Bible. I thought, according to the Bible, that if I confess my sins, the Bible said, what? He's just and will forgive him. All right, faithful and just. Now, does he see those sins after you've repented? Where are they at? The Bible says, see of forgetfulness. Never to be remembered no more. Far as the east to the west, and ain't no far to east to the west. You go east, you come back west. You go east, west, come back east. There is, if it said north and south, it would have limitations. Uh-uh. He can't see your sins because they're under the blood of Jesus Christ. This blood world is covered by bumper blood of Jesus Christ, and he can't see your sins. Why would you not want a God like that? A God that, how do I do it? I tried to preach it years ago and got in trouble. How do you preach a limited God? Do you know what I mean? There's things that he said I don't remember. He limits himself by his word. And he said, I don't remember your sin. How come? Because they were annihilated not just forgiven, annihilated. Are we still in the Bible? You understand what I mean? I mean, you said, well, Brother Dale, you're trying to make him real like some kind of something. Well, that real there, if he is that, then he limits himself to that. And by him being if he was a spirit, he'd see everything over here and he'd have to remember all of my sins. Are you with me? But if he's a person and a being and by his own word, he can wipe its slate so clean until it can't be remembered. Can I quote Brother Brandon? Let me ever remember he made this statement. Something paraphrasing, but it's close. He said, I can't bring out from under the blood what somebody has put under there. If you don't believe that as to be a quote, you ought to believe it for reality. I can't see what somebody's put under the blood. Oh, what a day. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Five, nine, oh, six. Boy. I feel the pull. I see. Uh-huh. At night I lay hey. and I, I begin, begin to, to cry. Anybody have a need? And my and mind I just fails to go. Is your God that real? I see the pool. Do you? I, I feel the pool. I, I hear the call. I know the spirit's moving. Brother Joe and the family's going on a little vacation. Gonna be gone for a little while. And they want to. 
Just be praying for her. All right. Let's just put a prayer cloth with it. And all of us remember it, right? What is it for? For God to take care of. Right? Lord Jesus, just be with the family, Lord. Give them a safe journey and take care of everything. Give them a good time in you. And maybe as the wheels turn on the car, they'll realize how you are taking care of them and being right there with them. We love you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Anybody else that would have a need? I know for sure that I'll reach the goal of thy fear. Be there and take care of it. Let everything be safe. Be home safe. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Anybody else? And I agree. Lord, please come and take control. I feel the sister done she stopped for a minute and wouldn't come to be prayed for and that opened up something for Satan and his ways to do and how often do we do that every minute of the day and all of the nights we do that and we open up that door and let that devil come in and how many of us are Lord we're all guilty and father we have one thing to believe in, and that is your mercy and your grace. And Father, we confess our faults and failures, our sister repenting and praying out to you, Lord, and saying, thank you, Lord, and just be thy Father. And to that demon, in the name of Jesus Christ, not anything we could do, but the very God that we spoke of tonight, the very being, the very person, He's right here. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for taking away the problem. And just take away all of our troubles and things, Lord. Because we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, let it be you. Amen. Anybody else? It's just very easy. Just take a thought and just get a thought. I know his that thought not right that allows Satan to enter therein that allows him to come in he said you mean to say that even the little thoughts that I have yes any little thought Why is it that the devil will tell you 
And don't tell me you hadn't, so just forget it. You say, what's Brother Dale got against me? He's against me in this or something. He's against me. Why don't you come and ask me? I'll tell you. You see, you're opening up to the devil to be able to come. And you build a case. You know why I know that's true? Because he does it to me every day. And I have to fight that. Every day, I have to fight that devil. I'm saying, why are these people not doing? Why are they not? Why is this? Why are they not concerned? And then I get a case. To give my But the thing of it is, we just got to go to him. But there ain't nowhere else to go. Then we come to find out, like I've always told the story. You be at work or something, you know, and something comes on your mind. Now, how many brothers, how many admit this? Something comes on your mind that your wife done a little something wrong or something. And all day long, you're thinking about it. And all day long, you're saying, she said so-and-so, and she done so-and-so, and she's got something against me. And all day long, and you get home, and you walk in the house, and your wife says, well, hey, honey, how you doing? Did you have a good day? That blows your bubble, don't it? Because you were ready to tell her off. You done planned all you was going to say. You done wrote it down. All you was going to say. And then when you get there, she just says, honey, I love you. Sorry if I done anything. about it. We're human beings. Right? Living in human bodies, trying to serve an eternal God. Okay. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word that you've given unto us. To know that you're real, Lord. And to know your name, and that name is Jesus. And even to know what you look like, Lord. We don't have to have that, but it's wonderful. But we don't have to go out and try to tell the world and put up a poster, this is what my God looks like, because they don't understand us. They think we're crazy anyway, Lord. And to them, I guess we are. Maybe sometimes to ourselves we are. But you just be with us, go home with us, give a safe journey, and just be that presence that's there with us. When something goes wrong, we recognize it. Realize if it wasn't for you, we'd been killed or been this, that, or the other. Help us to follow that, Lord. We love you. And we thank you. All of these that'll be traveling, going on to different things, Lord, we just pray that you'll be with them and take care of them. And just bless us all together in your loving grace. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You dismissed. There's a blessed time that's coming, coming soon. It may be clean.